Thank you. Um, as Christy said, I'm Katie Call. I'm the Conservation Policy and Practices Specialist for the Nature Conservancy in Michigan and the Great Lakes. And today we're pleased to have with us Dr. Steve Pulaski, the Fessler Lampert Professor of Ecological and Environmental Economics at the University of Minnesota. We have Heather Starrett. She's the Great Lakes Regional Coordinator for NOAA's National Ocean Service and their Coastal Services Center. Uh, John Fosgett, owner and forest management specialist with Compass Land Consultants, and Dr. Amanda Weinstein from the Economics Department of Univers at University of Akron. Thanks to you all for being here today and welcome. Thank you. Um, we just saw a video featuring two of the Nature Conservancy's top scientists introducing and defining ecosystem services and really talking to us about them being um, nature's benefits to people. Our CEO, Mark Tursik, recently released a book entitled Investing in Nature, and it relays um, some examples from around the world of where different ecological and economically viable um, solutions, win-win solutions for people in nature have been achieved. So, you know, it, it's timely that we're talking about um, these issues today because it's, it's touching the work that a, a lot of us do. So today we really want to focus in on the Great Lakes, though. And um, Steve, maybe we can start with you. Um, what are some defining ecosystem services in this region? Why is this something important for us to be talking about right now? Right, well, I think uh, you know, the term ecosystem services, the, the benefits to people, I mean, that really, you know, this really is the, the benefits of nature to people. So how do people in the Great Lakes benefit from things that happen in ecosystems? Clearly the water is important. It was mentioned in the video. The, are the Great Lakes states. I live in Minnesota. We're the land of 10,000 lakes. Um, but what happens in the water or the water quality depends upon what happens up, upland. So what happens on the land affects what happens in the water. And clearly we all benefit when we have clean water for drinking, uh, for recreation. Uh, there's been studies both in Michigan and Wisconsin and Minnesota of the value to property owners if you live on a clean lake versus a less clean lake. So, so clearly water and the services, recreation and drinking and so forth from water um, are, are vitally important to people in this area. But as was suggested on the video, it goes much, much broader than that too. Uh, the food we eat. Well, uh, many of the foods need to be, uh, the crops need to be pollinated. Uh, many of the uh, fruit crops, um, uh, need natural pollinators, so are we, what are we doing with uh, habitat for, for those pollinators? Uh, pest control, similarly in agriculture. But even in cities, uh, where we wouldn't think about nature playing such a large role, um, uh, just planting of trees in cities can, can reduce the urban heat island effect so that during the summers we don't have to have so much air conditioning or planting shade trees uh, by the house. So there's many, many ways that if we learn how to work with nature, we, we benefit. Mm -hmm. And all of these systems aren't necessarily created equal. I mean, you were, you were saying that we depend on natural pollinators for a lot of, for our food, whether it's commercially grown agriculture or hand-picked fruits. And um, there's a big wine growing industry, I know, in, in Michigan as well and, and throughout a lot of the region. So um, biodiversity and, and healthy habitats are important. Um, I guess, Heather, following up on that, I mean, as we think about our Great Lakes coastal system, Steve's talking about water. Help us understand what a, what a coastal system looks like in the Great Lakes. Is it um, a rocky shoreline? Is it sandy? How do people interact with the coast? How, do they, how are they impacted by it? Why should, we, why should we care about these coastal systems beyond, the, beyond what Steve was saying? Sure, well, I think um, for the Great Lakes region, it really is the pulse of our economy. Uh, it's where the nexus between our human dimensions, the place where people live, work, and play on a regular basis, um, really intersects with our uh, commerce, our transportation, uh, the recreational activities that really drive the cultures of, of the Great Lakes um, as we know it. Uh, I too come from Minnesota, but um, you know, there's that culture of going up north to the cabin and spending time along the shore and looking for agates. You know, we don't have seashells, but we look for agates. Um, those are the types of things that I think really define our culture um, here in the lakes. You know, I think also it's important to note that when we think about ecosystem services in the context of our coastal realm, 
um, we start to think about those areas where you get a lot of return on investment for investing in, in the nature of those ecosystems. So in the coastal realm, uh, we think about things like wetlands. Uh, and they produce you know, a variety of benefits, uh, not the least of which would include things like um, protection from, from flooding. Um, they absorb the energy when we have large coastal storms. Uh, last year, I believe it was, that we experienced some of the flooding and wave actions that were associated with Hurricane Sandy coming all the way in inland from the Atlantic coast. Um, and then you know, third, uh, we also see this, this important um, relationship in helping us to mitigate climate effects uh, by ha acting and serving a, as carbon storage sinks for, for our region and, and throughout the coastal realm. I think one other thing that we do um, in the coastal realm, which is really important, is that um, we have this tremendous cultural heritage in the Great Lakes. Um, it goes without saying that we have a tremendous resource for maritime heritage, for sailing, for being out on the water, for being in relation with the water. You mentioned that, Steve. And, and so communities benefit and communities. from the tourism that all that brings. Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, if we were to uh, be speaking with our, our tribal nations here on this panel, they would be talking about cultural resources in a completely different context. You know, perhaps we would be discussing things like wildlife, moose, and wild rice, and things of that nature. So I think um, there's really a myriad of, of things that we could look at in terms of ecosystem benefits in the coastal mm -hmm. realm. Do you see opportunities, or any of you, um, to forge um, some creative solutions in coastal systems or, or the watersheds that, that feed those, that, those near shore areas. I mean, water drains off the land, as Steve was saying, the land is connected to the water. Whatever that water touches on the way into those tributaries is delivered down to the Great Lakes, um, affecting the, health, the overall health of, of those larger lakes. But do you see um, opportunities right now to develop some creative solutions in, in um, these coastal watersheds that are going to benefit both the conservation value that you're talking about, the cultural value, um, as well as keep those those communities that are de uh, depending on tourism alive and well. Do you see examples of that happening, or opportunities that we should be um, embracing? Sure. And I think you know one of the most real time uh, opportunities that we see right now is through restoration activities on the ground. So if we look at the return on investment, you know, removing marine debris, for example, from key waterways or navigable channels, um, and actually creating healthy, um, high quality water, high quality wildlife habitat for fish, birds, you name it, um, those are some, some very quick returns on investment, I think, for investing in nature. The other thing that comes to mind is um, thinking about um, investing in, in education and trying to get folks more aware of the value of the ecosystem services that are provided by these, these areas as well. I think it will produce um, a lot more uh, stewardship at a local mm -hmm. level. So trying to get folks engaged at the community scale and aware of what those resources are and the values that are associated with them. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great point. I think when you bring people in, it really lets them see the value of ecosystem services. And I think it also includes some you know, open spaces and parks and recreation that has to do with the lakes. They really see the value, not just for themselves and the recreation value, but they start to see the ecosystem value along with it. So there are, you, you, you said, what can we do or uh, making some progress yeah. on this. And actually in the water area, there's been a number of really nice developments. Um, so if you think about uh, watersheds, you know, what, what happens up in the watershed will affect people downstream. Um, and oftentimes we've, we've, just because of the nature of political jurisdictions or um, lack of ability to coordinate the sort of what the upstream people do that affects the downstream people it doesn't, you know, there, there's been a, a mismatch or a, a disconnect. disconnect there. Um, but a number of cases, and the Nature Conservancy has played a very positive role here in uh, creating what are called water funds. So people downstream um, say that, that need clean water. So the prime example of where this got started was New York City. And they went, uh, they said, well, we're either going to have to take actions upstream in the, in the Catskills and the other places where we get our water to protect this, or we're going to have to build a filtration plant. Well, the filtration plant was going to be really expensive. It was going to cost them six to eight billion dollars, the estimates were. Mm -hmm. Rather than doing that, uh, they worked with uh, landowners and municipalities up in the Catskills to protect the watersheds, provide buffers that would keep the water clean, and not have to spend that uh, money 
uh, doing that. Now, this is a clear case where you know bringing together the people who benefit from clean water with the people who take actions that can affect whether that water is clean. You know, it's not only good for nature, but it's clearly was clearly good for the people of New York City. Right. It's a, it was a great forest restoration story, and at the same time, as you said, benefited um, all of those residents of New York City who received that drinking water. Um, speaking of forested systems, I think that we do have a video that we'd like to show now that um, kind of translates what sustainable forestry can really can really do for um, the larger Great Lakes region. When most people think of the Nature Conservancy, they don't think of a forester marking trees and, and harvesting timber. John Fosgood is tagging trees in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Trees soon to meet their end by saw blade. Fosgood helps manage the two-hearted forest reserve for the Nature Conservancy. This is a vast tract of woodlands. It's now a demonstration project to show how a timber harvest will work to benefit everyone. Can you have conservation value in a managed forest too? So the hypothesis is, is that through utilizing the techniques that we're developing, we can have a healthy, diverse forest and still provide a sustainable source of timber and jobs to the economy in Michigan. The northern forests mean billions of dollars each year from the lumber, wood pulp for paper, even firewood for local residents. Timber cutting is this region's heritage and culture it goes back 170 years. The timber industry is what gave Michigan and the Great Lakes its first place in history, really. We supplied not only the region, we supplied the nation and we supplied the world. In the mid-1800s, these forests were literally cleared to help build a emerging society and culture throughout the Midwest. Those forests grew back, and those are the same forests that we're trying to conserve today. What you had, what you saw during the period of the 19th century, is we completely depleted our northern forests across the entire state of Michigan, which led to everything from the silting in of our rivers and the extirpation of many species, including some charismatic species like the grayling. We had the only Midwest population of Arctic grayling in the Great Lakes. That prized game fish drew anglers here from around the world. The grayling were last seen in the 1930s. Today, there is a lot more concern for our fish and other wildlife. When we first set about our conservation work on the Two-Hearted River watershed, we quickly realized that road stream crossings pose a significant threat to the health of the watershed. The road stream crossings not done right, stop fish from migrating upstream. If they can't do that, they can't reproduce. Now the foresters and conservationists are working together to remove those barriers, all within the next two years. We'll be one of the first, if not the first watershed of that size to be completely barrier free. So all of the road stream crossings in the watershed will have been removed and replaced with crossings that are no longer a barrier to fish migration. We're learning more about the complexities of the northern ecosystem. The forest of today is not the forest we had before. At the Two-Hearted Reserve, John Fosgett is working on a restoration plan to get us a bit closer to the way it was back in the 1800s. We know that through past management, our forests have lost a certain degree of their diversity. So we're putting seed trees on the ground in the Two-Hearted. We're creating canopy gaps to try to encourage the growth of mid-tolerant tree species such as yellow birch. The research here goes beyond sustainable timber harvests or better fisheries. It's much bigger than that. A single tree can hold hundreds of gallons of water. Multiply that by the millions and millions of trees. The northern forests affect the water table, water levels, even the climate. Forests have a huge impact on global climate patterns. And one of the things that we are confronted with right now in light of climate change is each forest type has a different water balance in terms of how much water it retains versus how much water it gives back to the atmosphere to feed these clouds like we're seeing above our heads today. And so what we need to understand are how our precipitation patterns actually going to change as our forests change. The work at the Two-Hearted Reserve should lead to more answers not just about the forest ecosystem,
but how to build and support a timber industry that's sustainable environmentally and economically. Everything from the forest product industry to the local municipalities, it has to be about full cost accounting of the cost and benefits of what we're doing. And that's what we're doing there is we're actually getting down and crunching the numbers and saying, what are the benefits to people? Can we sustainably manage those local economies and, and larger regional economies while at the same time we're doing the science on the ground and measuring the real changes and improvements to biodiversity? Well, John, you are engaged in a lot of interesting work in the Upper Peninsula, and I know you work in Wisconsin and Minnesota as well. Can you give us a little um, a picture of where, where are in those states the northern forests are located, and then how are they connected with the, the communities and the economies of that region? Yeah, thanks, Katie. Um, the, the northern forest, when we talk about the northern forest, um, when we, we looked at the video you know, in the mid-1800s, the, the, all of Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota was forested. Those forests were cleared, and what wasn't converted to agriculture, the emerging you know, society and towns in the upper Great Lakes, turned back into forests. So those are the forests that we're managing today. In, the, in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota, that's about 53 million acres of forest land spread around Lake Superior and then the northern parts of the lower peninsula of Michigan. Um, within that forest, obviously, as we've talked, those forests serve critical um, roles in providing clean air and clean water and connectivity for a lot of wildlife species and biodiversity and things that we talk about. But uh, just as important or more importantly, those are centers for economics and the way in which the people in the northern part of this region live. Um, you know, we've got the timber industry, which provides uh, a tremendous number of jobs uh, to the economy. And a lot of those towns that exist in the northern parts of this region uh, most likely wouldn't be there if it wasn't for healthy forests where people could go to work, where people live, where people recreate, and then provide all those other ecosystem services that we talked about here today. So what are some examples of how the forest industry is making choices? I know we saw a little bit of that in the video, but what kind of choices are they making that are providing um, economically and ecologically sustainable opportunities over the long term? Well, the, the forest products industry, um, let's just talk about Michigan. And Michigan provides about $12 billion in economic stimulus to the state every year. Mm -hmm. uh, one in 10 manufacturing jobs in the state of Michigan is related to the forest products industry. Uh, if you look at um, the forest-based recreation industry, um, some figures are that that's another $3 billion to the economy in 50,000 jobs uh, in the state of Michigan alone. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there, there's a, an, an interest in all of those people who operate, whether recreationally or from a timber production standpoint or timber products, to manage that resource sustainably. And, um, you know, we've done that for uh, a lot of years in that part of the world. But we're starting to think now more about conserving these landscapes. Um, you know, one of the things that we talked about was in watersheds, that those watershed boundaries cross <clears throat> political boundaries and jurisdictions. Well, the forest cross numerous ownerships. And so the challenges when we talk about protecting the northern forest is that you have to deal with a large number of landowners. It might be, you know, state or public ownership. It might be private ownership. It might be industrial ownership. So what we're starting to do now is look at practices where we can protect that forest across all ownerships so that we can all benefit uh, into the future. Mm -hmm. And how, I mean, you, were, you mentioned that um, forests really kind of drive the, the livelihood of a lot of those northern towns and cities. I know they have an impact downstate too, the, the benefits that folks in Chicago and Detroit and Milwaukee, they, they receive benefits from those forests too in the form of um, the way water, the way water flows downhill as I've heard you say in the past. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the forest play critic. I mean, we talked about water quality, and it, it kind of struck me. You know, we, you know, we, we're, we get to live up there, so we get to play up there too. And I was out on Lake Superior uh, Sunday, and we were off pictured rocks, and, and I kept thinking that we were going to run up on the rocks, and I realized that it was 20 feet of clear water mm -hmm. on top of those rocks, and those forests are responsible for the clarity of that water, mm -hmm. and that water ends up down the lakes. That air is something that we all uh, enjoy in the lake states, and so they really do have a critical function. Although people may not live and work there in the lower parts of the lakes, they certainly provide a lot of the things that we all enjoy. Sounds like a nice Sunday afternoon. Yeah, it wasn't too bad. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think the forest along with the coastal you know, areas and the ecosystem services provide a quality of life and that's really important uh, for regional economic development. It's been showed that natural amenities, you know, having a clean environment 
uh, really impact regional economic growth. So you don't have to be an environmental advocacy group to be for a lot of these things. You, it re should really matter that it really impacts whether people are moving to this area and the growth that's happening in these areas. And I was just going to offer, I think, too, that there are some lessons that we can learn in terms of investing in nature about how we manage our landscapes. And I think that's the point that you were trying to make, John. Um, working across interagency groups like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is actively engaged with these landscape conservation uh, cooperatives. It's, it provides a good opportunity for us to be looking at these landscape changes and looking at land use and land cover and how we've managed our lands over time and then looking at how that impacts the near shore or, or doesn't. How has it benefited mm -hmm. the near shore perhaps? Um, so those, those I think are really important, uh, not only dialogues to be having, but also to inform what next steps we might take in our management practices going forward. There might be new opportunities. We're seeing, <clears throat> excuse me, through NOAA and looking at some of these land cover um, change analyses that we're doing, uh, the emergence of new wetlands. Well, that's an opportunity. You know, our coastal programs through, which are um, officiated through the states, that's an opportunity for them to be looking at possible conservation efforts and things of that nature, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. One of the really interesting things here, I mean, John, as you, you, as you said, there are lots of benefits that come out of forests. And one of the challenges, though, it seems that a landowner or a forest owner they will get some of those benefits if they sell the timber, um, maybe if they are uh, running a, t a tourist lodge or and so forth. But many of these things are um, benefit wider society, and the, the the forest owner themselves may not actually mm -hmm. capture this. So, for example, uh, it was it was brought up that uh, forests play an incredible role in uh, carbon cycling. You know, they store lots of carbon, which otherwise would be in the atmosphere and uh, enhancing the greenhouse effect. Um, so one would like to reward forest owners for providing that service for society, but right now um, it's it's very difficult. Now there are some emerging markets uh, for this, but um, but there are many cases where uh, the services or the benefits that are created by forests are, don't flow back to the to the forest owner or even the, to the local community. I, I think that's one of the difficult things, and and. I mean, we, we work in, you know, whether it's water or the forest or those kind of things, and, and you don't truly appreciate the interplay between all of those things. And certainly the average landowner doesn't realize that, you know, my management practices are going to have an uh, impact on water quality and air quality and connectivity for, you know, certain species. And so I think there's, a, there's an opportunity or there's a challenge in that there, there, there's a challenge that we need to communicate to the public that, that everything that we do has an impact on all these systems that we all appreciate. And like you say, there's direct ties to timber and those kind of things, but um, you know, if, if we can figure out how to place value in water quality or air quality, um, then I think that uh, you know, we can really start to, to move the needle on protecting these large landscapes. Mm -hmm. We've seen a lot of examples too, I know, of whether it's in small towns, big cities, coastal towns, those inland of green infrastructure investments really, you know, playing playing a beneficial role to people who live and work in those communities. Could you talk a little bit, Amanda, about um, some places where, where we're seeing those kinds of benefits? Uh, yeah, so when we talk about green infrastructure, we're talking about using, you know, soil and vegetation and open spaces to help with a whole host of things from uh, helping with floods to storm water, um, to helping with the heat island effect that Steve talked about earlier. And we can see that in a lot of areas. I live near Cleveland, and so Cleveland's actually, um, the EPA's um, doing research to look at. They have a lot of vacant areas there uh, where we have uh, vacant buildings and vacant lots. So looking at demolishing these buildings and turning these vacant lots into open green space to help with all of these things. And it really has a double benefit of not only helping with the things I just talked about, but also revitalizing these urban neighborhoods. And it can, and that can have an additional benefit of attracting, uh, you know, we've called green migrants. So they're kind of these young professionals who care about these environmental things in their community. Um, and it can also have benefits that we don't even think about. So one is crime. So when you have these vacant lots and these vacant buildings, there's this kind of broken window effect. And fixing that broken window or that vacant lot can actually reduce crime in these areas. So the benefits, um, there are envi environmental benefits, but there are a lot um, of other benefits, you know, including crime and including the area. And just the biggest benefit is really who we attract to that area. And we can attract the young professionals I talked about. And that's really um, how we value a lot of these systems. 
do we attract people to this area? And people vote, you know, with their feet of where they want to live, and that's how we can tell how they're valuing these systems. They also vote with their dollar, so we can see how much they're willing to pay for a house. It's one another way we can value these systems. So a lot of times we have policymakers will tout, you know, their low housing prices, and isn't this great? But it's not great because it's also a sign that people don't want to live in that area. So it's one way we can value these areas is by looking at housing prices and see do people want to move in these, these areas and the natural amenities and ecosystem services and having clean water is a big impact on how people value an area. And a lot of these green infrastructure approaches, green roofs or rain gardens, um, improve, you know, tearing down buildings that might not be a service to the community anymore um, for urban gardens or parks, those are adding quality of life benefits, aesthetic benefits, as well as the cooling effects you mentioned. But um, just, yeah, improved quality of life that make people want to be in those areas. How, how did, I don't know, maybe the city of Cleveland, for example, where the example you were talking about, how do, you, how do they decide um, when to act? What do they grapple with? You know, what are the benefits of action versus inaction, acting now, waiting too long? Yeah, that's a great question. So, I mean, we have upfront costs with these things, with tearing down buildings, you know, making these green spaces. I also lived in Dayton for a number of years, so they've really worked on improving their riverfront, making it open to people using the riverfront for hiking and biking and that sort of thing. Uh, and you have upfront costs with that. They uh, tore out a lot of dams so people could use the river for canoeing. Um, and so there is upfront cost to overcome, and people have to understand there's upfront costs. But I think the important thing to focus on for people and for policymakers aren't these upfront costs, it's the long term. And we, we really need to be looking at the long term economics here. And long term economics say that these you know, projects are really worth it. It's worth it for the improved quality of life, it's worth it for the uh, people that we draw into this city and the people that will stay in this city for this improved quality of life. Choose investments in that city over the long term. Mm -hmm. I think we have a video to show now about how uh, one city, I think Sheboygan, Wisconsin, actually chose uh, the choice of action now. So let's take a look. Working together, we have completed all of the dredging and habitat restoration work required to transform this area of concern into an area of recovery. We're celebrating a major accomplishment here in Wisconsin. Uh, we're taking an area of concern, a river that has had uh, pollution problems, and uh, celebrating the restoration of that. Many know the city of Sheboygan, located in Wisconsin along the shores of Lake Michigan, as the bratwurst capital of the world. In summer, Sheboygan bustles with tourists and fishermen who flock to the waterfront for swimming, boating, fishing, and to compete in the Dairyland Classic, the largest freshwater surfing competition in the world. But nearly 30 years ago, Sheboygan became known for more than water sports and brats. Following decades of pollution from nearby urban and industrial sites, the lower Sheboygan River and Harbor was identified as a Great Lakes area of concern. The governments of the U.S. and Canada designated 43 areas of concern around the Great Lakes. These were the most contaminated sites with the legacies of uh, the heaviest toxic pollutants on the lakes. For Sheboygan, the pollution and area of concern designation weighed heavily on the local economy, which relies on clean rivers and lakes to support the tourism and commercial fishing industries. We had a fish advisory for all the fish that were caught here. They contained PCBs and you could have some but not too much of that type of fish. But it wasn't just unsafe to eat the locally caught northern pikes and smallmouth bass. For years, the sediment contamination in the Sheboygan River had made it impossible to dredge the harbor. And without dredging, large commercial fishing ships carrying Lake Michigan trout and salmon would have to dock elsewhere. Determined to make a change, Local, state, and federal agencies came together in 2012, removing 400,000 cubic yards of contaminated sediment from the Sheboygan River and Harbor and investing heavily in waterfront habitat restoration. All in all, this cleanup cost just over $80 million. I think there's a lesson in that. Um, the cost of cleaning up environmental contamination is very high. Preventing environmental contamination is much more cost effective. While the cost of environmental cleanup can be daunting, in Sheboygan, the benefits to the local economy are undeniable. One reason we got involved, it, was, it helped keep the commercial fishing industry located here in Sheboygan from having to move someplace else where they could bring their boats in. 
So we have benefits for the folks who use the river, um, who have businesses along the river, who recreate in the river, and those just who enjoy the outdoors. From lake surfing to brats, then an EPA area of concern, Sheboygan is changing its identity yet again. It will now be celebrated as a shining example of how environmental action can kickstart a local economy, leading the way for the other Great Lakes areas of concern. There are 43 areas of concern that exist in the Great Lakes, and only two of them have been delisted or removed from that uh, AOC designation. Other areas are asking, how did you do it? How did you put it together? Well, it was good municipal cooperation. The restoration of the Sheboygan River has really been an excellent example of how people can work together and really make a difference in their community. People at all levels, people at the federal level, people at the state level, people at the local level. It's just amazing what a group of people can do when they get together and put their mind to a single goal. So back to the question of why are we here today talking about ecosystem services and the link to social and cultural and economic well-being. Um, I think a lot of us are aware of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. It was originally appropriated at over $300 million. Um, the original full appropriation has been reduced to an undetermined lower amount. At this point, EPA just put out a call uh, to award about $9.5 million. We're really not sure what you know what that amount is going to equal to in the end but can any of you expand on the ramifications of what it means to the work that you're doing right now or how it may support the work that you're doing right now um how how is how is glri affecting the work that you do heather yeah so i guess it's um important to mention is this isn't the first cut that we've experienced under the great lakes restoration initiative um, it's the, probably the most significant anticipated cut to date um, and so it's sort of the death by a thousand cuts. When we see these types of budget rescissions or reductions, it actually impacts and degrades the, the overall effectiveness of the entire program as a whole. Um, from a NOAA perspective, you know, what I'd like to share with folks uh, is that 95% of our GLRI coastal funding that comes in goes right back out to local communities and partners. And so, you know, the impact isn't only felt by the federal agencies, it's felt all the way from the federal down to the local government and, and execution scales. So um, from that perspective, I, I think what's being discussed right now is a very significant potential impact to our ability to make a difference on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, many of the areas of concern that we are working very steadily to try to delist in the Great Lakes region are, um, are very expensive to, to delist. Mm -hmm. And so um, Superfund sites are a great example of the scale of, of um, dollar coverage that would take to, to actually get these areas delisted. So I think it's important to note that and you know in terms of um, impacts back to local businesses and things of that nature, you know we work really closely with local cities and um, a good example is we've been investing quite a bit from a coastal perspective at looking at water levels and what are the impacts to coastal communities and what happens with severe storms and things in that nature. Um, you know the Great Lakes harbors, you know no pun on the word there, but we harbor some of the most significant ports in the US um, from a commercial shipping perspective. And so when we have impacts to our Great Lakes, when we have um, significant climate change that results perhaps in highly variable water, water levels, that impacts our commercial shipping industry's ability to get out and, and do business as they would like to, to mm -hmm. do business. Um, so knowing more about and investing in some research so that we understand what the baselines and how much is changing over time, those are important investments for our mm -hmm. future and, and being able to forecast what impacts will be over the long term. Mm -hmm. What about, um, you know, from a private industry perspective, John, how, do you, how would you, are you impacted by these cuts? Yeah, absolutely. You talked about the GLRI funds filtering down to local businesses and, and, and uh, governments. The, you saw in the, the video, on the forest video, that uh, the two-hearted um, watershed that we uh, had inventoried all the road stream crossings and through a partnership of, of private funding and donors as well as a big chunk of GLRI money, we were able to, we just got our last little piece of funding to fix every road stream crossing in that watershed. And that work was done by local contractors, local excavators. You know, my company had a big hand in that. So those GLRI funds have been a big part of our business model for the last couple of years. Um, I think, 
you know, the, the, you take a, a watershed like the, the Two Hearted, or we just saw that uh, video on, on Sheboygan. Um, if you can get people focused around an idea that if we can fix this, then our quality of life will be better, then you need to look at local governments, local agencies, and other agencies to help fund those important projects when people realize that this is to the, the public benefit. Right. Because we can't always go to GLRI or some of these places to, to fund these projects. I think that the, the cuts are probably going to continue for the foreseeable well, And it was never intended to be a long-term right. funding yeah, solution. It was intended to be about four years, and it's catalyzed great work throughout the Great Lakes Basin, a, a lot that I, probably all of us here are, are benefiting from right now in one way or another, whether it's through the work that we're being funded or, or quality of life that we're experiencing because of it. Um, so, so what's next? I mean, I, this is the focus of the next panel that we'll hear, but how do we all, businesses, communities, conservation, come up with some innovative um, solutions to start thinking about these win-win these win-win opportunities. Well, I think, you know, one of the great things about the direction we've moved in in thinking about um, systems, both nature and people as part of a system, is then drawing the links between actions in some place and benefits someplace else. So the science of actually making those links, how important is it, how does this affect people's well-being and livelihoods, um, and then bringing in, whether it's uh, um, a company or an agency or a public-private partnership, like on those water fund examples where you're actually bringing together the people who benefit from something with the people whose actions affect, affect those benefits. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of good examples. So the water funds is, is, is one good example. Um, in, the, uh, in, in forestry, there are now, um, and in agriculture, there are people who are bundling together uh, like carbon benefits and, and so if I maintain my forest I can now get some payment for carbon. So those kinds of ideas and it's not strictly government, government has a role, it's not strictly private but certainly private has a role, but these partnerships that try to bring together the beneficiaries of actions with the, with the landowners and others who, whose actions affect them. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. the partnerships thing is a, is a great idea and when you look at within cities and urban uh, re revitalization you also have partnerships with kind of community development coalitions and if you get the community involved uh, sometimes the best ideas come from the people that live there and the people that you know know this area and have lived with this area have lived with the forests and the coastal regions uh, so really getting the community involved as part of that partnership uh, can really help. Yeah, and I'll just add to that, you know, another good example is actually here in the great state of Michigan where the Michigan Coastal Program has actually um, submitted 10 different um, community grants out to actually help with the establishment uh, planning, mapping, and marketing a water trail across the coastline and, and in the near shore of, of the Michigan uh, Great Lakes Coast. You know, that's a tremendous asset. It builds in that public-private partnership it um, redirects federal monies to be able to leverage, you know, rubbing the nickels together and make those dollars go a little bit further. And it's doing a great service to the community because it's actually encouraging them to get out and experience the great investment in nature that we're all making together. So, so if there was um, kind of a one thing that, that you wanted viewers of this panel discussion to walk away with an idea, something they could do, a piece of, of information to take forward. Any, any final thoughts from folks? Well, I'll throw in one, which is so uh, I started out, you know, I was in economics, but I've always had an interest in the environment. And, you know, at the beginning there was some tensions like, well, you're either on the environment side or the economic side. I think the point here is this is all one thing, mm -hmm. right? So we're doing good investments in conservation maybe for its own sake, but also importantly for people's sake, for, for well-being as we've talked it through a number of these examples. Yeah, and I'll kind of piggyback on that, you know, from the economic point. Uh, so we actually in Cleveland had a Cuyahoga River fire that happened uh, a number of decades ago. And a congressman, Lewis Stokes, had a very good quote, I'm going to paraphrase, but basically said one of the most devastating impacts of this are the perception of Cleveland it made. It didn't you know, portray it as this progressive, productive city that, it, that he really viewed it was at the time. And that perception can have long-run impacts, economic impacts, where people view the city poorly and don't want to move to that area and don't view it. Uh, but it also has a positive impact that we can change that. Uh, the Cuyahoga is now a national park. Uh, people go there, 
you know, there's lots of hiking and biking trails and people enjoy that park every day. So we can turn it around, but we really need to look at the long term and it has long term environmental impacts as well as long term economic impacts that are important uh, to everyone in the community, all businesses, all residents. It's interesting. Steve said he started in economics and now he, you know, thinks about biological systems. I started in forestry and I spend as much time thinking about economics now. So I think there's probably that relation and the one take home message would be that all these systems, whether it's forests or coastal watersheds and all these things are interrelated and that if we're concerned about protecting our economy, protecting our way of life, then you need to think about the northern forest you may not live there. You need to think about the coastline you may not live on the coast, but all of these things are so closely related that we can't think about any one thing by itself. Yeah, and I guess my, my final thought on this is that win-win um, solutions sell themselves. Uh, they just make economic and environmental sense. And so um, just encourage folks to get out and experience nature uh, firsthand because I think then they might find that they have some, they may discover some unique values that they themselves have and that they can pass on to their future generations and actively look for ways to do that. We have a few minutes for um, some questions from the audience. First question, please. Hi there, good morning. Uh, my name is Hugh McDermott and I'm with the Michigan Environmental Council. And it's really exciting and heartening to hear uh, this discussion of the economic value of our natural resources. Um, things like how uh, billions of dollars in new infrastructure was avoided by protecting the uh, Catskills watershed in New York. Um, the value of wetlands uh, in flood protection and water quality and how we can reduce our infrastructure costs. Um, and those sorts of things, shade trees, reducing air conditioning. Um, and this is a great discussion. Unfortunately, it seems like the, the, uh, the science and, and the research is well ahead of our public policy um, discussions in our politicians. Uh, in Lansing and in Washington, D.C., we rarely see these economic um, values of natural resources factored into public policy debates. Um, I don't know whether the politicians don't understand this um, or don't care, but my question to you all is how do, we, how do we move discussions like this one onto the floor of the House and the Senate and committee rooms where they can make a real uh, difference in the big picture? Uh, I can think of one example that we talked about when we were talking about forests before this segment. Um, you look at Michigan, there's a $12 billion direct tie to the forest products industry. That's everything from harvesting trees to trucking those trees to the mill and, and then turning that into a product. When you look at Wisconsin, they have a similar acreage of forest land, 16 million acres of forest land in Wisconsin, 17 million in Michigan. They have a $20 billion stimulus to the economy. So the question is, well, what's the difference? Are they cutting more trees? Are they, what's happening? And, and what it is, is it's secondary processing. So what Wisconsin has done partially is they've kept a lot of those products in the state and then they've manufactured goods out of those products. And that's where the real value add is. So again, there's a lot of discussion on harvest levels in the state of Michigan and are we cutting enough timber? And my answer to that would be well, there may be more resource that we could utilize, but we need to think about how we're going to use it after we, after we harvest that tree. Can we encourage uh, sustainable industry certified products and those kind of things? So I think there's, it's, you know, you can't just look at one aspect, you need to look at the whole industry. I think, I think policymakers often have the incentive to look at short term, and that's really the biggest problem. And so what we have to do, and oftentimes uh, they don't want to you know, tackle these upfront costs, even though there's long run savings. And what we have to do is, because I think they think their residents and their voters won't understand, but I don't think that's right. I think they will. I think if policymakers are upfront with their voters and say, there's an upfront cost to whatever this ecosystem service is, but look at there's a long run benefits and really be honest about it. I think that their voters will see that, yes, in the short run there'll be costs, but in the long run it will be better. And a lot of that is holding policymakers accountable in the long run, and that's hard to do. And a lot of that's up to us and up to the media to make sure that we don't just look at the short term, that we follow up on what these policymakers are doing. Yeah, and I, just one final comment on that question. I think um, with regard to trying to get it into the public arena and on the Hill, is, as you described, um, part of the onus is on us uh, in communicating that information and, and really translating it into something that's actually actionable. Um, how The terminology that we use sometimes may not be the most appropriate terminology to actually convey the message that we want to, to send. So it may be something uh, translated into a, a, a cost from a dollar perspective. If we're talking with corporations and businesses, it might be looking at cost avoidance or cost efficiencies gained. Um, either way, we need to do a better job of knowing who our audiences are and trying to convey to them what these uh, economic values are in meaningful terms. One more question. 
name is Greg Norwood with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I'm a wildlife biologist at uh, Detroit River International Wildlife Refuge. We uh, have uh, many projects, GLRI included, invasive species, etc. What are the specific features um, uh, that, that can make an ecosystem restoration rehabilitation project uh, most relevant to an increasingly more urban, uh, suburban population and really inspire the next generation uh, of, of uh, conservationists? I think a lot of that comes to uh, open spaces. Uh, so making sure there's open space, and a lot of that actually comes down to kids, having parks for kids and open spaces, forest trails for kids to enjoy. Uh, when they enjoy these open spaces early, then they're more likely to stay in that area, which helps the urban area. Um, it also helps for just relationships. Part of quality of life is uh, not only the recreation that we uh, get to enjoy, but also you know the time we spend with our family. And if we can spend that time with our family on lakes and on rivers and on hiking trails and enjoy that, uh, then that really impacts that city and impacts the regional growth in that city uh, and helps the urban area. I'll follow up on that. So one of the things here, I mean, th we've been trying to make the, the case of sort of tying through links from actions all the way through to how does this affect people? So one of the things I would think about in any conservation project or restoration project is in what ways are, uh, is this going to have important impacts that, that people uh, will care about? So, you know, the recreation, the open space is certainly one of them. Uh, you know, is this affecting water quality in some important way? Is it affecting fish uh, that, that uh, is, you know, is an important fishery or, or recreational site? Um, so, you know, how can I think about how this project affects how the system operates and affects, affects people? And one of the, I think the really, uh, you know, the, the question about politics was maybe uh, somewhat, uh, you know, pessimistic, but, but uh, you know, this, I actually see that uh, this language is now starting to become more mainstream. So companies are thinking about that. Even uh, the federal government is thinking about this. Maybe not, uh, you know, congressional hearings as much, but, but agencies certainly are talking about ecosystem services and how do they fold this into their operation. So, you know, in the restoration project, what is it doing? How is it affecting the system? And how does that affect the people who, who depend on that system? Thank you. And thanks, thanks to you all. Um, it's been a great conversation. Appreciate your time. And now back to Christy.